In chapter two of Consciousness and the Brain, deciphering how the brain codes our thoughts, Stanislas Dayan tackles the question of the unconscious. How far can a stimulus that is presented to us below the threshold of our conscious awareness actually travel in the brain? And to what extent can it affect our behavior, our cognition, and even our language? Although the concept of the unconscious is typically associated with Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis, Diane points out that the concept is much older than that, and that we can find different discussions of the unconscious that are not committed to a psychoanalytic philosophy in the writings of people like William James, but even older philosophers such as Spinoza and even the Roman physician Galen. For quite some time now, a number of neuroscientists have insisted that the unconscious is indeed real, but that it is localizable to a particular area of the brain. Although here there's disagreement. Some argue that the unconscious is located deep within the brain in subcortical structures, thereby drawing a distinction between a conscious cortex and an unconscious subcortical reality. Others have argued that the unconscious is actually localized in the right hemisphere due to the specialization of the hemispheres, with the left hemisphere being sometimes called the analytic hemisphere in charge of things like concepts, distinctions, mathematics, language, and the right hemisphere being associated with things like emotion and the processing of entire wholes rather than their parts. Now, other people have argued that even if we cannot distinguish between, let's say, the cortex and the subcortex or between the right and the left uh, sides of the brain, that we can nonetheless differentiate between some cortical networks or some cortical circuits that are conscious and some that house the unconscious. Now, Diane is not a fan of the localization theory of the unconscious and argues that we make a gigantic mistake when we try to restrict the operations of the unconscious to particular brain areas, whether that be subcortical units, the right hemisphere, or any other isolated or privileged neural networks. Instead, the unconscious is something that engages the entire brain, of course, depending on context. But it means that we need to think about it as a whole brain phenomenon. Nonetheless, he agrees that the unconscious is real and sees that we see it operating very clearly in two groups of people. People with and people without brain damage. Let's start with people with brain damage. There are two phenomena that have been studied in laboratories uh, throughout the world that point to the workings of the unconscious. The first of these is what is called blindsight. Blindsight might sound like an oxymoron because it combines two terms that seem to contradict one another. Blind, meaning the absence of vision, and sight, S-I-G-H-T which means the presence of vision. Blindsight has split the scientific community as people disagree what it means, how it works, or how it is produced. But in the shortest version that I can give you, blindsight refers to cases of people with damage to the primary visual cortex, so the occipital lobe in the back of the brain, who report not seeing certain things but nonetheless, when forced to make a choice, act in ways that indicate that they clearly must be processing the visual information in question in some way. So for example, a lot of patients who suffer from blindsight are unable to tell the orientation of lines. So they will see maybe the line, but they won't be able to tell you whether it's straight, horizontal, or slanted. Now, if you ask the patients to, for example, take a letter and put it through an opening in a wall or through a door where there is a hole that is like a line that is slanted, that is horizontal or that is vertical, the fascinating thing is that they succeed at putting the letter through the slot. So they match the orientation of the letter to the orientation of the opening. Nevertheless, if you ask them if they saw the orientation of the opening, they will simply say and insist that they did not see it, that they cannot tell you whether the opening was like this, like this, or like this. That's why it's called blindsight, because these patients are blind about certain features of their perceptual world, 
but nonetheless, they have some kind of access. So they see something, even though they're also blind to it at the same time. And here again, we see a kind of unconscious processing that should trigger a lot of questions about what it is that the brain is doing in constituting experience. A second example that Diane gives us for thinking about the unconscious in cases of patients with brain damage is what is known as spatial neglect. This happens when there is damage to the right hemisphere, which again is considered by some the seat of the unconscious. In spatial neglect, a person will have visual access to an entire field, but they just neglect, let's say, the left or the right side of that field. So, for example, a patient with spatial neglect might wake up in the morning, they might go to the mirror and shave their face, and then they will finish shaving, and they will believe that they finished shaving. But then when they come out of the bathroom, it turns out that they simply shaved only half of their beard, and they just didn't notice that they didn't shave the other half of the beard. Now, what is happening here? Two things are worth noting. The first one is that, again, there is nothing wrong with the retina or with the eyes, which means that the information is going through part of the visual system, but it is not getting processed in the right way, or at least in the way in which it typically is. The second thing, and this is a point that Diane makes, is that we need to interpret things like spatial neglect as problems of attention meaning that the patient in some ways sees or registers the entire field, but they just attend to only a part of it and they completely neglect the other one. So for example, a patient with spatial neglect will finish their plate of food and then complain that they're still hungry without realizing that they haven't touched the food on the other half of the plate. Now, these are cases in which unconscious experience is produced by brain damage. But what about people without brain damage? Can we say with any certainty that there is unconscious experience or unconscious mental happenings going on? Diane says yes. And he gives a number of examples as evidence. One of them is something that he discusses in chapter one as well, which is subliminal messaging. When we are presented with a subliminal message, i.e. a message that is presented for such a short span of time that our brains register but do not process all the way to conscious awareness, we're talking about a level of unconscious processing that can alter the way we act. Another example of unconscious processing is simply the way in which our brains bind the world of experience. So when I look at, for example, a painting or when I look at a plant, I see colors, I see shapes, I see, uh, I hear sounds. All of this is given to me through various sensory receptors. So how is it that my brain, along with the nervous system, combines all of that into the unified perceptual objects that I experience in the course of my everyday life? Like the painting or the plant? Why don't I see shapes over here and colors over here? Why is it a unified whole? According to Diane, that kind of binding of properties where I see a plant that has a certain shape and a certain color as the same object happens largely below the threshold of conscious awareness. But it's not just the unity of experience that is happening unconsciously. The processing of contextual information is another example of the unconscious. So this is where we can talk about one of my favorite examples from uh, the chapter, which is what is known as the cocktail party effect. As in, you go to a cocktail party um, and you know that it's a lot of people there, there's a lot of noise, and you're trying to focus on a discussion that is happening in the other corner. Diane points out that we can, with focus, and attention, quiet the room and zoom in on the conversation that is happening away from us, which means that we have the power to push everything else into the background, into the unconscious or the pre-conscious. Nonetheless, even though we can do that, we remain in some way aware of what's happening in the party. Because if I'm listening to what other people are saying in the other end of the room, but suddenly somebody says my name behind me, 
I still hear my name and I still process it and I turn around, which means that even though I push things into the unconscious momentarily, my brain is still keeping track of what is going on. And this is what he calls the cocktail party effect, which of course doesn't only happen at cocktail parties. Another example of this is the processing of complex meetings. Diane spends a lot of time in this book talking about how our brains can process quite complex meanings and ideas, not just basic stimuli, on an unconscious level. So, for example, he spends a lot of time talking about what he calls unconscious mathematics, meaning that our brains can actually do basic levels of mathematics without us being aware of the fact that they're doing this. Um, one really good example that he gives of this also is error detection. The fact that when we go to sleep, for example, and we lose consciousness, our brains are very busy consolidating our experience and trying to make sense of um, what's happening the previous day, um, sorting out what is important and what is not important and discarding what is inessential. But as our brains are doing that, they're also doing something else. They're trying to figure out solutions to problems that we faced when we were awake. So according to the end, there is a lot of mathematicians who report finding the solution to a math problem that stumped them while they were asleep. So they wake up and suddenly they have the idea and it's as if unconsciously in their sleep, they figured it out and suddenly it fell down from the heavens at the moment of awakening. This would be another example, arguably, of unconscious mental processing because it's happening during sleep. Now, the conclusion that I want to draw here is the same one that Diane himself makes, which is that our lives are deeply, deeply affected not only by what is conscious, but also by what is unconscious. And this means that as the French psychoanalyst Julia Kristeva once said, we are strangers to ourselves.